In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Early this summer, it seemed as though Willy Wonka had taken over a part of the produce section of the grocery store. Perhaps you saw them with their pink bag, the name just begging you to give them a try to see if this magical idea could be real. Cotton candy grapes. <laughs> if you didn't get a chance to try them, look out for them next year because they are real. <laughs> And they do indeed taste just like cotton candy. They were actually created by a fruit geneticist who wanted to take the sweet, almost cotton candy flavor of a, of a variety of fragile purple concord grapes and make them sturdier and more marketable. Over 12 years, he hand-pollinated and cross-pollinated millions of grapes until he reached the flavor, quality, and strength he was looking for perfect cotton candy. There are no artificial flavors used to make them. It is all natural. They do have a bit more natural sugar than traditional table grapes, but they also have all the same vitamins that make grapes an excellent snack choice. <laughs> now, good, good grapes, whether this new cotton candy variety or even the old Concord grapes that my great-grandfather used to grow in his backyard. Oh, grapes can be a delicious fruit. And yet, there are a few things more unpleasant than a sour grape. Right? Have you ever done that accidentally? Pop it in your mouth and you're like, oh, God, no. <laughs> That's not swearing. You're literally talking to God about what you just said. <laughs> A sour grape is one that's acidic because the sugars in it have not yet matured. We often think of sour grapes, for example, for how that phrase is used in Aesop's fable, right? When a fox who is unable to reach the grapes that he is seeking convinces himself he must have been sour all along. Not even worth trying for. But sour grapes was also a phrase that became common in an expression among the Jewish people during the Babylonian exile. Both in our reading today from Jeremiah and also in Ezekiel 18, we hear this expression. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That is, the parents ate sour grapes, but it's their children's mouths who are puckering uncomfortably. It's the children who are experiencing the consequences of the folly of their parents. The expression is, is likely a way that the Jewish exiles made sense of the destruction of their nation, their experience as refugees and exiles far from home. Their parents had sinned, and now they were suffering the consequences. It became a way of saying they were not responsible for what they were experiencing. It was someone else's fault. Imagine that, blaming the generation before you for the promises of to problems of today. Ah, boomers. <laughs> obviously a joke. <laughs> but you can't really blame the Jewish exiles for this coping mechanism given their experience. As one scholar described the time of exile, ripped from their holy homeland, forbidden access to their sacred temple, both by physical distance and the devastating fact of its destruction, they surely thought their God had abandoned them or worse still, that their God had been defeated. And as we heard in last week's reading from Jeremiah, into that anguish came Jeremiah's letter instructing them to put down roots in Babylon, build houses to live in, set up shops to practice their trade, to seek the welfare of Babylon, even to pray for their captors. And one way they got there, they got to that point, was apparently this phrase, our parents ate sour grapes, our teeth are set on edge. They blamed the current situation they were in on the failure of their ancestors and parents, so sought to make the best they could of a horribly difficult situation. But in our reading for today from Jeremiah, the prophet says that phrase will be no more. It will exit the common language of the people. Rather, Jeremiah says, it is the person who sins who will experience the punishment. Everyone who acts foolishly, who grabs a handful of grapes from the vine before they've ripened, they will experience the consequences of their choices themselves. 
And then Jeremiah goes on to promise a new covenant that God is making with the house of Israel, one that will be better than the one their ancestors broke. In this new covenant, God says, God will put the law of justice in their hearts. No one will need someone to tell them right or wrong because each person will have a real and authentic relationship with God, will be able to feel deep within their hearts what truly is right and what truly is wrong. God will forgive their sin. Even better, God will forget all the wrong they've done. Maybe you know what that's like to long for a part of your own past to be forgotten. Something you did or something you said, maybe even long, long ago, that still haunts the back of your memory every now and then. Makes you wonder, feel deep down that you're probably never truly good enough. Or maybe you've gone through times where you have felt abandoned by God, where redemption seemed like a possibility that was surely out of reach. I hope you can hear God's words in this reading. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. I hope you can believe that this is the kind of forgiveness that is offered to you as well. Like the Babylonian exiles, sometimes we struggle experiencing and believing in God's forgiveness because the impacts of our failures are so abundantly clear. But as one of my favorite prayers in the prayer book says, our God's property is always to have mercy. God's defining characteristic is a mercy that is sometimes beyond our ability to imagine or hope. We just need to accept it. And then let that mercy change us from the inside out. Because at other times, also like the exiles, we resist the change of God's mercy. We're sure that we're, actually, we're not to blame for what went wrong. Our parents, our ancestors did things wrong and they ate sour grapes. Why should our teeth be set on edge? Why should what happened in history have anything to do with me? And make no mistake, there are some sour grapes in our history. Last week was the federal holiday of Columbus Day. This is a man whose crew brutalized the people of the Caribbean. A man who wrote about taking girls as young as nine years old as sex slaves and trafficking them. A man who gets a federal holiday in his honor. Many years after that, later centuries, when the United Fruit Company wanted to keep their land monopoly that they had in Guatemala, our government helped oust their democratically elected leader, and we provoked the longest running civil war in Central America. We did that to protect our business interests because we like to keep our produce cheap the rise of the middle class in the 20th century a rise that's the reason so many of us have what we have today because of what happened in the middle of the 20th century that partially took place at least because of the benefits that were given to soldiers returning from world war ii benefits that gave them access to education to buy a home their own home american dream reached but did you know that African-American veterans were explicitly excluded from the benefits of the GI Bill? Even though they fought the same war, they bled the same blood. They came home and tried to go to college or buy a home and they were told, not for you. There are some sour grapes in our history. Not true, we may not be right now as a church living in the Babylonian exile, but we are experiencing the increasing exile of Christianity from a place of respect in American culture. And the truth is that we deserve it. The church deserves this exile. Our parents and grandparents, our ancestors ate some grapes that proved very sour, and dang it, our teeth should be set on edge. Because it's one thing to know and believe God can forgive you, but it's another thing to make right the wrong that was done. 
So as much as Jeremiah wants the Babylonian exiles to know that God will not destroy them for the sins of their parents, that God is a God who forgives, Jeremiah still wants them to know that they are culpable for the choices they make today now when it comes to the wrongs of the past. They must choose whether the law of God's justice will be written on their hearts, whether they will make choices that were different than their parents, choices that will seek to make manifest the justice God intended for all people, a justice they had gone astray so long ago. God will always forgive, but they must decide if they will make right that which had gone wrong. Because if not, uh, they're just going to wind up in exile again, far from home. Another day happened this past week. This past Wednesday was the 22nd anniversary of the death of Matthew Shepard. A young gay man who was tortured and left to die tied to a fence near Laramie, Wyoming. So let's talk about the difference between culpability and complicit. I'll use myself as an example. I am certainly not one of the people that committed that heinous act, of course. But I need to acknowledge my complicity. Because speaking of sins that kind of haunt you from your past, I'm haunted by some anti-gay slurs I used as a middle school kid who should have known better. Those words hang out right here at the back of my head. It's hard to let them go. And if I really want to rid my conscience of the guilt, I need to acknowledge that I was complicit as a teenage kid in the culture that created people who killed Matt Shepard. I was a part of that. So I need to ask what I must do to make it right. What I must do to push the world I live in a bit closer to the love God has for it. What I need to do to make God's love and justice for my LGBTQIA plus siblings more manifest in this world. If God's law will be written on my heart, I can do no less than that. As much as it sears me sometimes to know my past. True, true. You probably don't have any slaves, despite what your teenagers might say. True, you didn't tie a gay man to a fence and beat him to death. Didn't take young girls from their homes on a Caribbean island and use them as property. But the truth is that our culture is built on these horrid realities. The wealth of the United States would not exist if whole swaths of humanity were not treated as property at best or as an inconvenience that needed to be dealt with so the founders of this new world could get what they want and build the great U.S. of A. So as we walk through this time of exile as a church, where it's no longer expected you show up here on Sunday if you want to get by, where no one's really actually interested in what we have to say about things anymore, And why would they be? As we walk through this time of exile, we must ask if we simply want to ignore our history, to wash our hands of things we had no part in personally, or if we are willing to let God's law invade the deepest parts of our existence. Will we allow ourselves to be fully known by this God who doesn't just want to forgive us to kind of wave a hand and say, oh, it's all okay. But a God who wants to heal us. A God who wants to heal that which is broken in us, even if it's been broken so very long. And then wants to use us, even in our brokenness, to bring God's healing to this world. Make no mistake, it hurts sometimes to have God's law written on your heart. It hurts because once you've allowed God's law to be written on your heart, you can never look at your life, your story, the history of your people the same. But sometimes 
the good news can be painful for a bit to get us where it needs to get us. Because if you will receive God's forgiveness and let it actually change you, then you can be the one who helps create a world where everyone has access to that kind of love. I mean, that was Jeremiah's dream, right? You wouldn't have to have other people tell you where God could be found because everyone had God. Everyone had found a safe home in God's gracious reign, in God's dwelling. You can help build that place. From the least to the greatest, God says, they will all know me. So perhaps it's time to find ways to start making right the wrongs of the past. Maybe it's time to finally let God forgive you for what you're holding on to and to ask what that forgiveness means for what you should do differently now. Maybe it's time to find some of the least of these in this world and enable them to experience the same love you have from God, to make God's love a reality in their lives. Because if God's love can be a reality in their life, then God's love can be a reality in yours too. Amen. Amen. Amen.